Praise the Lord. Well, we come again uh, in June. We said we'd be studying this prayer of Paul's from Ephesians chapter 1. And so tonight we should conclude that. And um, next week we'll have a prayer gathering. Okay, prayer and praise and gathering because there's so much to pray for. Um, so that's what we'll do next week. And then the week after... Uh, on the Wednesday night, um, Alan Jones is going to take the Bible study for one night. Okay. Um, okay. So that'll be um, in a fortnight. Um, so let's turn as we have been doing for the last few weeks to Ephesians chapter one, to Paul's prayer in Ephesians one. And because it's the um, last night we'll read the whole prayer from verse 15 down to the end of the chapter Ephesians chapter 1 commencing to read at verse 15 therefore I also after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints do not cease to give thanks for you making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Let's just bow our heads. Father, we realize this is precious moments around your word. Lord, we've come to hear from you. And Lord, we just pray tonight that you bless your word to each of our hearts. That Lord, we'll be open not only to the blessing of the word, but to any challenges that may arise as we look into your precious Holy Scripture. So Lord, help us, help me as the preacher. Lord, I need help tonight. It's so hot and sultry, but Lord, I just pray you'll be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we have been sharing really a lot in what's been happening with Paul in his own heart as he prayed for these saints. And very quickly, to just remind you, he began by saying, after I heard of your faith and your love in the Lord Jesus, I cannot cease but to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. And we looked up into detail what he meant when he said your faith and what he meant when he said your love for the Lord Jesus your, and your love for all the saints. And then we put those two things together and looked at them very carefully. On the second week, we began to look at his requests. And I don't know whether you remember but this far back or not, but I said to you, it was a bit like ordering a load of stuff from Amazon and it all coming in one big box. And um, Paul, instead of... Um, getting all these items separately. They were like all in one big box when he was praying for. But he started with the big box. 
that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. And we looked at what he meant by the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation. But the key thing was that it was all in the knowledge of him. Not just a head knowledge, but an experiential knowledge, because there's so much more that we can have in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, when you got saved, we're echoing. When we got, when we got saved, um, we gave our hearts to the Lord. Yes, you got your ticket to heaven, but that's not it uh, in itself. That's the ticket to heaven, yes. But, you know, we can grow in the knowledge of him and have more of Christ in our lives. He said, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. And we looked at that in great detail. And we finished that week by going into one of the little things in the box that he that his first request that he pulled out, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. And we looked at the hope of our calling and what that means for us uh, in future days. And then last time we were here, we were looking at the other two things that were in the box, that you may know what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Amen. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? And um, it was a wonderful thing that we could look into that and look at this exceeding greatness of his power. Because you see, this knowledge of God that he wants us to have is something that's a transforming truth. It's something not just for you to know in your head. It's something that should transform us, not only in our understanding of them, but that they'll more and more deeply impact our lives. Well, we concluded last week with what are the riches, uh, sorry, what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe. Because there's a reason, folks, why we have to press on in the Christian life. Life can be exceedingly hard at times, as you know. And there is a reason why we need to survive when we're in this spiritual battle that we have with these forces in heavenly places that we talked about last week. And the reason why we survive is because this immeasurably greater power of God is at work on our behalf. You see, God's not only working in your life to take you to heaven one day, but thank God uh, where we'll have his inheritance, but God is keeping us now from day to day in our lives, this power that is at work in us. Well, we're going to come back to that to begin with tonight about this power towards us who believe. Because he goes on to say, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality, power, might, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the age to come. And so Paul's answer really is falling into three parts just there alone. Who says that he, the power that raised Jesus from the dead. You know, when you think about that in all its fullness, it's a tremendous thought. Because as you know, Three times in the New Testament, we read of people who died and were raised to life. There's Jairus' daughter. There was the widow of Nain's son. You know, that woman, they were on the way to the funeral. And Jesus raised him from the dead. And then there was his friend Lazarus, 
who was dead for four days. And uh, they raised him, Jesus raised him from the dead. But as you all know, every one of those people were raised in the same body that they died in, and they died again as years, you know, as the years went by, because they still have the same body. But you know, when Jesus was raised from the dead, he was raised in the same body in which he was died, but now he had an immortal body. And so a body that lives forever and a body that cannot die again. That's why there's a man in the glory tonight. Hallelujah. And you know, friends, the wonderful fact is that same power that gave Jesus that immortal, eternal body is, is keeping you from day to day through your Christian life. That's the power that's working in you. Now you've become a Christian. And the glorious thing is, one day you'll have an immortal body because he's going to give you one. You know, praise the Lord. Either you'll get one when we meet Christ in the air, hallelujah, or you'll get one when you come out of the grave. Praise the Lord. You know, if you go in a grave, you're not going in it very long. Hallelujah. Because Jesus is going to raise you up again at the last day. Your soul will already be with the Lord, but the body and soul will be united. That power, Christ himself, is that power. You know, we eagerly wait a Savior, it says in Philippians, from heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables men to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. You know, friends, that's more than he did for Jairus. That's more than he did for the widow of Nain. That's more than he did for Lazarus, because they've had bodies that's died again. But thank God they will get a body like we will get, hallelujah, when they're raised at the last day. But you see, that body that we will get will be full of strength. It will be full of health. It'll be full of energy, free from weakness, free from sickness, and it's going to last forever. Now, you see, Paul is taking this illustration here from Jesus. He could have taken it from creation about the wonderful things that God did when he made the mountains and the seas and so on. But he didn't. He took it straight back to Christ as to just how immeasurably great God's power is. And so, friends, that power is working in you. Why do you think he wants you to have more of the knowledge of him? And he said, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places. You know, friends, it, way back in the Psalms, it was prophesied, sit thou at my right hand, speaking of Christ. And um, what does it say in Romans 8? Who is he that condemns Jesus who died? Um, I've counted the and is, was raised to life, and is at the right hand of God, also interceding for us. In Hebrews chapter 1, it says, After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Lord Peter, Jesus Christ has gone into heaven and sits at God's right hand with angels on the authorities and powers in submission to him. You see, friends, he's in a great place at the right hand of God. And that is a place of great dignity, great honor, great privilege, great authority. That's why in Philippians it says God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above everything. Friends, I tell you, our Savior, up from the grave he arose, and now He's ascended and seated at the right hand of Christ. And what's more, it says in the heavenly places. Now, that is an important phrase in this chapter, heavenly places, because it's the second of five references to these heavenly realms or heavenly places that we have in the book of Ephesians. Paul never refers to them 
anywhere else in the New Testament, these heavenly places, only in the book of Ephesians. And five times, twice in chapter one, once here, uh, sorry, once in chapter two, in chapter three, once, and then in chapter six, where he talks about the heavenly realms. And you know, friends, a lot of people deny this in our world today. So many people are just living for this material universe. You know, all that they can access with their five senses, what they can see, what they can touch, what they can um, explore, what they can investigate, what they can analyze in this way or that way, or what they can penetrate with spaceships. My, there's more spaceships going up now, bringing bits of rock back from the moon, and they're all open to send your on your holidays to the moon if they find somewhere. Friends, it's a load of rubbish. And they talk about climate change, and they're spending all this, sending all these rockets up into the air, my word. Submarines, you know, we've got telescopes and microscopes and scans and all sorts of it. But friends, there's an invisible realm that they'll never know anything of. It's in the heavenlies. And here we can see that one of those things about the heavenlies is that Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Friends, that thrills my soul. Because, friends, he tells us here, it's far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. You know, friends, I find that absolutely fantastic. Because in chapter 6, as I mentioned last week, he was talking about spiritual rulers and wicked forces and demonic forces, you know, in the heavenlies. And he was going on about them and telling us to put on the whole armor of God, which we need to do so. But friends, we've got someone greater who is seated at the right hand of the Father, above him. Hallelujah. And he says, far above all principalities. Hallelujah and power, and might, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the age to come. Friends, no wonder, we used to sing this, and we'll perhaps sing it once when Mark's leading on a Sunday morning. It's in Redemption in Booth, Mark. Far above all, far above all, God has exalted him. Far above all, hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Friends, this thrills my soul. Because, you know, friends, when I think that we are related to someone who is superior to all other powers in the universe, and what's more, above every name that is named in this age, not only in this age, but in every age to come. And, you know, friends, there is no other power that will ever equal Jesus' power. Far above all. And you see, it's going to stay forever. So I want you to grasp this, and Paul wants them to know this in the knowledge of him, this spirit of wisdom and revelation, all about these things. Why? Because the wonderful thing is this. Those powers have are what are working on your behalf, in your life, changing you, making you more like Jesus day by day. And friends, we've no need to be discouraged in the Lord. Hallelujah. You know, we get down, don't we? We get disheartened, we get things. But it's only because we've taken our eyes off our focus. Friends, we're being changed day by day by the greatest power and authority that there will ever be. And what's more, he says he's put all things under his feet. So absolutely everything is subject to Jesus Christ. 
Now, friends, Paul's saying here, really, remember it. Experience it. Pray that we'll know more and more of that power in our individual lives. What a wonderful thing. But as we move on to verse 22, he says something that's very important. He put all things under his feet, we've said that, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness who fills all in all. Now, for the benefit of perhaps somebody who may be a younger Christian here, when he says he is given to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, we need to ask ourselves, what church does he mean? Well, he doesn't mean just Leyland Pentecostal Church or any other church, whatever brand or variety. <laughs> you know, because about 57 varieties out there. But it's like Heinz, isn't it, when you come to the church? But there's all these varieties. But you see, what he's talking about is those who are in the universal Christian church. Who are those? Those that are born again of the Spirit of God. So there'll be churches in this town, including our own, where there are some people who are born again, and there's others, perhaps, who aren't born again, never got born again, and they're just churchgoers. Well, they're not the universal church, so they won't be in heaven, will they? But, friends, those who are born again of the Spirit of God, those who've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, redeemed, hallelujah, and born again, oh, praise the Lord, transformed out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of his own dear son. It doesn't matter what the color of our skin is doesn't matter what age we are it doesn't matter what race we are it doesn't matter what our social position it doesn't matter whether you're male or female it doesn't matter which branch of the church you belong to but we are his universal church united to him and united to one another now it's about this word church that we're going to spend a little time thinking of now because it says he is head over all things to the church. And then he goes on to talk about the body. So what does he mean by his ruler over all things to the church? I mean, we know he's ruler over the stars and the planets. He's ruler over all authorities. Everything's subject to him. But friends, he goes on here to say he is head over all things to the church. You see, there's a good reason why God has done certain things for the sake of his church, for its growth, for its protection, and for its success. Let's just take a closer look at this. You see, friends, where do we see Jesus at work exercising authority over all things for the sake of the church? Where do we see it? Well, there are two kinds of things that happen to God's universal church in the world. There are good things and there are bad things. And you know, God is at work on behalf of his church in both of those things. You see, there are certain things that happen in our world. Good things that result in blessing for the church that help to secure and create the kind of conditions within the church can do its work unhindered and care for its members 
and preach the gospel. What kind of things am I thinking of? Well, think of countries where they've been closed to the gospel for years and years and years, and then suddenly they've opened to the gospel. You know, in the 80s, was it? I think that was it the ninth, early 1980s, that the collapse of communism in certain countries. You know, certain companies, countries, not companies, countries became wide open to the gospel. And for years, they'd been closed. When I think about our own country, you know, friends, it's only in the, was it late 1600s that the church ever really got a freedom to worship God? You know, when you think of all that took place before that, and when you think that laws did get passed for the protection of Christian liberties, allowing us to meet freely, allowing us to live in accordance with the teaching of God's word, think about national peace. You know, war is always disruptive to the church. When a nation becomes embroiled in war, and we've seen it in Ukraine and in other places, but you know, friends, how on earth does God, you know, al allow these things to happen, and yet he still works through them? and brings good, doesn't he, for his church. What about places where how Christian literature has been translated? I'm thinking of uh, the Bible Society, the Wycliffe translators and other things, and Christian books going to countries where Christian Bibles and books have even been banned, and yet they've got in to the country. Because in spite of every effort to keep them out, they've found their way in. You know, I'm talking about this country, wasn't I? In the 1600s, wasn't it the Tyndale Bible that got banned? And what about Luther and all his works and all that? And, you know, I'll tell you, friends, but they, 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 they fought on. But, friends, we've now got freedom to have Bibles as we wish. And as you think about these good things that happen, they've been a blessing to the church. And why have they happened? I'll tell you why they've happened. Because God has given Jesus Christ to the head over all things to the church. Praise the Lord. That's wonderful. Christ is exalting his headship in the interest of his church. You know, friends, we don't always see this invisible hand that's at work. That's why it's not even a waste of breath to pray for countries like North Korea to open to the gospel. Or like China for the opening, the real opening of the gospel. You know, friends, God is at work. And the interesting thing is this. When you think of some of these places, like Ukraine. Now, we're praying for the ending of the war, of course we are. But did you know that while this war's going on, Ukrainians in their own country and even some who've come across here are turning to Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. What a great encouragement. You see, God works good in the good times, but he works even in the bad times when bad things happen. You know, there was a day once when North Korea was the scene of amazing revival. It was strong and free was the church. But now, of course, 
They're not allowed to be Christians. They have to be secret Christians. But you know, friends, God can even make his church bigger by doing things. You know, war can scatter believers. Church in Damascus got scattered, didn't it? I mean, that was not in Israel, that's in Gaza, but that church got scattered, or lot of it did. And communities have been scattered through war. But God has gone on working with the gospel. You see, when I think that wherever harm has been tried to destroy the church, God has worked. What about Stephen, you know, when, it, when he was martyred? You know, the church in Jerusalem was scattered, it says. But everywhere the disciples went, they preached the gospel. And thank God, the church grew and grew and grew. You see, friends, we might not always see things as a good situation. Sometimes we might think things are in a bad way. But God is working his purposes out. He knows exactly what he's doing with the church because he is head over all things to the church. Think about how Christ overrules. Think about how Christ is making you purer day by day if you don't realize it's going on, but something's going on, and God is doing a work in you. But friends, it also says the church which is his body. Now, friends, in Colossians, it says he is the head of the body, the church. And friends, there are some very important things that Christ has to say about the church and the body. You read it in Corinthians, you read it in Romans, and us all having different ministries. But in Ephesians, he actually talks in chapter 5 when he's talking about wives and husbands. Turn with me there. Ephesians 5. We'll start to read at verse 22. Now, you may say, why on earth are you reading a passage on wives and husbands? Well, it's because it's also got to do with Christ and the church. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present to her, to, her to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Now, you know, friends, this is a chapter largely about wives and husbands. But you see, it's showing us how Christ is our head and how Christ is the saviour of the body, He's the saviour of the church. You know, the thief comes to steal, to kill and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. So, friends, Christ is our head, is our Lord, is our Savior. But notice, as our head, just as he expects husbands to give leadership to the wives, Christ expects Christ gives leadership to the church. In other words, he not only has given us life, but he's giving us spiritual leadership, headship, leadership. That's not, um, you know, he's not lording it over us in the sense of, you know, that's why he doesn't want 
husbands to be controlling over their wives. He doesn't say be controlling. He says head, doesn't he? And that means giving leadership in the home. And of course, what kind of head Jesus is? Because he's a loving head. Hallelujah. He's leading us, but he's doing it lovingly. And that's why he said, husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. That's why it's so important in verses 25 to 27 of Ephesians 5. Christ is our loving head, giving loving leadership. You know, sometimes we can say, why then, if God has such amazing love for his church, does he allow all these bad things to happen, uh, even to Christians? But you see, friends, Christ was so loving that he gave his very life for you, that you might not perish but have everlasting life, that being unholy, you might be made holy, holy, beautiful, with his radiant beauty that every member of the body of Christ shares. And you might say, well, if he's head of all this, how is he loving if bad things happen? But you see, notice this. God sees the big picture. He just doesn't see what goes on here and now. God is working a purpose out. Christians who are being persecuted in some countries None of us want them to be persecuted. We pray for them. But at the same time, God tells us in his word that people, Christians, will be persecuted sometimes. And sometimes, sadly, they, they lose their lives through persecution, that they might be made worthy of their calling and, and you know, worthy of their... Um, they get a big crowd, though, I'm sure, for doing so. But, you know, friends, we might not understand why all these things happen. But as I've said to you, I've illustrated this once or twice on a Sunday morning. Um, it's like having an old radio. Do you remember the old transistor radio with the knobs? And there was the short wave and the long wave. I used to like twiddling the knobs, watching the line go right across the thing. But you see, God sees the bigger picture. But so often we only see the little bit. We see the short wave. We only see what's happening now. But we don't know what God is doing in a bigger way to fulfill. And so Paul in his prayer, and I must finish, but Paul in his prayer in Ephesians chapter 1, just notice these words. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ Jesus when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in this which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. I reckon that, that when Paul was praying for that spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, and then followed it with all that, friends, it's a big package. But God's got it for you. And that's why we can pray for these things. You know, I, I I sat reading this chapter once and, you know, every line, I was praying it into myself. Well, you know, asking God to give it because I want it a lot about you. So be encouraged as we come to the end of Paul's prayer in Ephesians. May God bless his word to our hearts. Amen.